Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Thursday, October 14th, 2021. It's my great pleasure and honor to be here with Professor Leroy Hood. Lee, it's wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. Lee, first things first, your given name is Leroy, but you go by Lee. Is that a nickname that goes all the way back to childhood? Did your parents call you Lee? No, my parents named me Leroy, and I was called Leroy up through high school, but I never liked the name. So when I went to Caltech as an undergraduate, I introduced myself as Lee. So I can beautifully separate my friends into those before and after Caltech, okay? It was a new identity for you. It was, it was a new identity for me, yeah. Lee, at a more official level, Please tell me your titles and institutional affiliations, and you'll note that I pluralize that because I know you have more than one. So I'm a Senior Vice President and Chief Science Officer for Providence St. Joseph's Health, and I'm a co-founder uh, faculty member and chief strategy officer for the Institute for Systems Biology. Uh, and both are in Seattle, Washington. Now, do you maintain an, a, an, an adjunct professorship or, or any other affiliation with the University of Washington? I have affiliate positions in bioengineering uh, and immunology. And that means I have access to grad students that can come over and do their PhD theses with uh, ISB. Lee, is that to say, do you do any teaching? Do you mentor graduate students or postdocs at this stage in your well, career? I mentor, I mentor graduate students. I have in the past. I'm not doing that right now. But um, I and I've always done a little bit of teaching, uh, usually in bioengineering. Tell but, me. I mean, it's a few lectures during the year. I will also say that we run a systems, a, a week long systems biology course for students from for a graduate program in cellular biology at the University of Washington. And that's uh, an intense one week course. And I teach in that, too. Lee, tell me about your work with Providence St. Joseph Health. When did you start with Providence St. Joseph? I uh, was asked in uh, April of 2016 by the CEO, Rod Hockman, whether I would consider being their chief science officer and affiliating ISB with Providence. And uh, I found that a very attractive opportunity because I'd had earlier experiences with precision population health. It, and my approach was a data-driven approach to optimizing wellness and avoiding disease. And I had an initial program in 2014 with 108 individuals. And then in 2015, I helped start a company called Aerovale which brought what we had defined as scientific wellness uh, to consumers. And over the next four years, we collected about 5,000 individuals. And on each, we had both uh, genome sequence analysis and longitudinal phenome analyses, so an enormous amount of data. The company did shut down in 2019 for uh, financial reasons. I will say the customers loved it and regretted we had to do that. But uh, we were able to use the data on these 5,000 individuals over the next year to generate about 12 papers that really defined what I'm doing right now, which we call Beyond the Human Genome Project. And that is uh, an approach to looking at the health trajectory of individuals in a data-driven manner and then optimizing it. And we are proposing to do that for a million patients 
uh, individuals over a period of 10 years. And we're proposing that the government fund this project just as it did the first genome project. And what's beyond the human genome is our longitudinal phenome analysis, which opened a totally new powerful window into health beyond the genome itself. So, uh, and what I was so excited about in accepting the chief science officer is he asked me to bring to Providence scientific wellness, genomics, and systems biology. And I think I've done that in spades and especially in the context of this major new program I'm pushing called Beyond the Human Genome Project. Lee, you mentioned the phrase precision population health. I wonder if you can define that and explain why the affiliation with the hospital would allow you to pursue this path of inquiry. Sure, precision population health is no more than taking a population of patients and generating in a longitudinal manner on them lots of data so we can follow their wellness and optimize it, okay? And what was exciting about Providence is it's a large healthcare system, 51 hospitals, roughly 10 million patients scattered up and down the West Coast. And it was clear that that was a candidate from which I could recruit the million person project that I uh, started to lay out at that time. Are there privacy issues with, with regard to patients and accessing this part of their health record? Are patients aware of this? Are they happy to take, take part in this, in this innovative research? A, a, a really critical part of precision population health and the data you generate from it is the ability to protect it and to gain trust from the patients. So we worked very hard to preserve the data. And when we did the data analysis, for example, we extracted from the records any way to identify the patients. It was just 5,000 abstract units of information. So there was no way from that to trace back to individual patients. Now that we're doing it with uh, uh, and that was with consumers. Now that we're doing it with patients, we need to keep a connection between the data and the patient because we want to integrate into the data their electronic health records, the history of their health in the system. And we've figured out how to do that and how to put it in the cloud and how to bring the different types of data together first to analyze it and then to integrate it and, and reconstruct the, uh, in, in a small way, the complexity of uh, individual humans. Lee, the program is relatively young at this point. What are you seeing so far? Uh, it, it is relatively young and we've just really aggressively started to move toward Congress to get this federal funding. Uh, as we did with the first human genome project. And we've talked with now of the order of eight representatives and senators from various relevant states. And uh, th there is real enthusiasm for the program. Now, whether we can get it funded this year in light of all the difficulties they're having with the infrastructural budget, or whether it'll have to come next year is unclear. We're going to try very hard for this year, but we've uh, a business plan in mind that will let us operate up until the time federal government can give us the $10 billion we'll be asking for this program. Lee, I'm curious in what ways your affiliation with the hospital and having all of these millions of patients to, to, to consider in what ways this provides an ideal framework for you to operationalize P4 medicine? Well, when we did Aerovale, which was a consumer play on wellness, 
uh, which was very, very successful. One of the big failures of Arafail was the data gave us deep insights into actionable possibilities for disease. But because of the FDA, we could not present any of those actionable possibilities. And in fact, the only way to do that is through physicians. So it was clear that one big step we had to take uh, in precision population health was to move into a healthcare system where the physicians would return the results to the patients in a manner in keeping with uh, uh, FDA dictates and so forth. So that was the imperative that was really obvious right after Aravail failed. I will say Aravail of the 17 or so companies I've started, in my view, was the most successful because it dramatically illustrated the power of precision population health and how it can transform health for individuals. Lee, you've explained why the hospital wanted to merge with Institute for Systems Biology, but looking at it from the other ways, in what ways was this merging good for the Institute for Systems Biology? Well, it was good in two ways. One, they were willing to give us money to increase our endowment significantly, and, and that just made it easier to keep uh, a nonprofit research institute that's relatively small, 230 people or so, uh, afloat. But I think the second thing is it allowed us to move in a direction I had moved my personal research in some years ago, namely toward translational medicine, thinking about how to understand disease in enormous depth and detail using the powerful tools of systems biology and then applying that eventually to patients. And so I think it gave us financial security on the one hand, and it gave us a whole new avenue for research opportunities on the other hand. And many of our faculty have taken advantage of this opportunity, for example, we have uh, 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 Jan Hedlock, a very interesting uh, MD uh, person who was at Microsoft for a long time in, in uh, a computation, then went to medical school and then decided she really wanted to fuse these two things together. She came to us and what she's done a wonderful job on is learning how to extract electronic health records in their entirety from this complex database called EPIC that most hospital systems use. And to put them in the cloud in such a manner that they can readily be queried with regard to fundamental questions. And an example is one of my students asked the simple question, in, in the 5 million electronic health records she has, how many women were pregnant over the last 18 months? And how many women were infected with uh, the COVID uh, uh, virus? And of those, what was the effect of infection at the first, the second, or the third trimester? And she was beautifully able to answer all of those questions. And this first year student has uh, a paper already accepted in Digital Lancet on, on that topic. So it shows you the opportunities that emerged from this. And it's a loose affiliation. The affiliation uh, essentially places a number of uh, people from Providence on our board, usually uh, two different people or three different people. And it, uh, otherwise we operate as we did before. We, we manage to our own way and so forth. And we, uh, it, and for big things, uh, we have to check in with Providence to make sure they agree. But 
uh, we've never been refused in any way, shape, or form. So, so it's been an enormous boon and opportunity that has uh, extended enormously our research dimensions into this uh, translational medicine. Lee, in recognition of the historical moment we find ourselves in, there's so many questions I'd like to ask about the COVID-19 pandemic. But first, for you on a personal level, over the past year, year and a half, with the mandates of physical isolation and remote work, how has your research fared? How has your business ventures fared during this time of physical and social isolation? Well, I would say overall, this has been one of the most productive periods of my life. And uh, in, in a number of different dimensions, one, uh, I have been able uh, until recently to use Zoom to push forward this Beyond the Human Genome Project and rally the troops and, and explore with uh, legislators, explore with company partners uh, and explore with uh, academics, uh, possible collaborations and so forth. More recently, I started traveling again. And uh, recently, for example, I went to New York City and gave a keynote talk at a biofutures conference about this beyond the human genome and, and announced the formation of a 501c3 nonprofit called Phenome Health, which is basically going to direct this entire effort together with uh, a few key partners. We can talk about that later. But the, the second thing I did was with a colleague at ISB then, Nathan Price, wrote a book on what 21st century medicine should be. And it's all about what I'm talking about with Beyond the Human Genome and everything. And it's just laid out in a historical context how when I started as a young faculty member at Caltech, I really started thinking about population health, the complexity of humans, what you needed to do to decipher the complexity. And that led to a series of paradigm changes I either led or participated in that got us to where we are today. Uh, I think the third thing that's been very exciting is uh, I've played a major role in starting a new company with colleagues at ISB and at the Karolinska in Sweden that is going to use powerful new techniques to generate peptides as drugs. And I can explain the rationale for that if you want to go on. But I think it is going to be uh, a turning point in how we generate drugs in the future because it can be done far more quickly than with uh, uh, the protocols that are used today for either small molecules or whole proteins. As drugs. Please do explain the rationale. What's what what is missing in the system now? What is missing is one small molecules as drugs have a lot of cross reactivities that you can't avoid because they're small, and that what's the leads to the toxicity in drugs. And two, the small molecules that have been screened so far lie in a very narrow domain of all the shape, space possibilities that exist in drug language. And what we can do is number one, we can use genetic engineering techniques to create 10 or 100 billion genes, each of which encode for a different polypeptide uh, 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 20 mer, that's the size we're starting with, that could be a potential drug. And we can put this into a virus which has the ability to infect mammalian cells. 
And so what we can do is create 10 or 100 billion drugs and put each of them in a different uh, 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 virus and then use them to infect, say, human cells that will be infected with uh, the oncogene virus, COVID-19 virus, and select out the cells that survive because those are the ones that the peptide protected the cell against the drug. So we can screen drugs on an unprecedented level and we can do it in the context of the cellular machinery in, within which the drugs have to operate. And that can get us to drug candidates that are very powerful, very, very quickly. And then we can look at the different candidates and see how they're related and optimize them. And for example, if we have this set up and functioning, we ought to be able to, within a, 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 a three or four month period, generate 10 really good drugs against COVID-19, okay? So that's the, and there are enormous technical details, but that's the big idea. Lee, from a scientist's perspective, I'll ask first a geopolitical question. Do you think it's worth getting to the bottom of the origins of COVID-19? Is that a knowable solution at this point? And is it worth going down that path? I don't think it's knowable because I don't think the Chinese will cooperate in that kind of investigation. And given that lack of cooperation, I think it's a waste of time to try and figure out what really happened if they won't give us the data and information they had about what really happened at that time. So my feeling is what we need to do uh, is let's get much better at A, recognizing pandemics and B, being able to deal with them really effectively in the future. Because look, you know, the, uh, a new pandemic could come out of Africa with nothing to do with uh, China or possible genetic engineering of the virus. And that that is a possibility you can't exclude, but I just don't think we're ever going to, we'll never have enough data to be able to settle that question. So I think what we should do is figure out how to deal with the virus really effectively. In the way you answered it, it suggests that it's unknowable to us, but the Chinese certainly do know how it originated. I think that's correct. But I don't think they'll, they've always been resistant with these kind of things and releasing knowledge. Lee, because you have your antennae up to these kinds of things, to go all the way back to early 2020, before it was headline news, do you have a specific memory of thinking to yourself, we have a big problem here. Well, I'll tell you, um, you know, we heard about it in 2020, but it became a reality for those of us in Seattle in February when the infected Chinese individuals spread it uh, uh, after a flight and, and uh and it, and it was clear it was a highly infectious virus and it was going to be non-trivial to deal with. And, you know, it was an utter disaster to have a president who kept downplaying and say it's trivial. These people, it'll be all gone in a week or two. And of course, you know, he, he went on talking that way, extending the dimensions as it was clear what this thing was. So, but, um, so, that's point number one. And I think point number two is this administration had really emasculated a lot of the protective measures that Obama set up. They fired all the people that de dealt with pandemic emergencies at the CDC. To clarify, Lee, I'm sorry to interject. This administration, you mean the prior, the Trump administration? I mean, I meant the Trump administration. But Look, I don't want to get into, so I think it was embedded in a, 
in extreme ignorance that didn't appreciate how serious this was, and it got away from us because of that ignorance. Now, if we really nailed it from the beginning, what could we have done? We don't know the answer to that question. And and again, uh, because Trump fired 100 people that had to deal with pandemic emergency measures at the CDC, we lost all of that expertise and people didn't know what they were doing really. So, uh, so it was clear very early on, it was going to be a tough road to deal with this virus seriously with that kind of leadership. Lee, I'm not sure if the data still holds, but I remember news stories where it was thought that patient number one in the United States was actually in the Seattle area. What was your interface with that being a local event for you? Well, it, it gave us immediate awareness that, look, this is something that seems more serious than just uh, uh, the cold virus, okay? Or influenza, which is uh, the comparison that was made for years by the Trump administration. Oh, it's no worse than an influenza infection. And, you know, it's killed uh, 700,000 Americans. Now that's slightly worse than an influenza infection. One has to, it's worse than World War II. That was 400,000 dead. So it's, it's a sobering event. And we clearly have to put in place the means for dealing with these pandemics in the future. And we really have the tools for doing so. Were you involved at all at a national political response? Were you in contact with people in Washington about how to deal with this in the early moments? No, where, where I got really involved was ISB put together, led by Jim Heath, one of the first really effective clinical trials that used this idea of enormous data procurement uh, especially in deeply understanding the immune system to understand the virus. And we published a, really a series of seminal papers in high dimensional data analysis and the deep insights it could provide into COVID. So I was more at the bench end of things than at the national level. Because, you know, at the national level, uh, the, the Fauci's and the Francis Collins of the world, I think were uh, up to date on what needed to be done. And they did what they could in the context of the government as it existed then. Lee, as you well know, one of the major problems with vaccine hesitancy is this notion that the vaccine was rushed, right? And so for you, with the proper historical perspective, I wonder how far back you trace the story in terms of the development and basic research in mRNA technology and how it was applied for the COVID-19 vaccine. Well, the mRNA research really uh, has been worked on for probably a good 10 years in various ways and different persuasions and so forth. And when COVID came along, it was at a place where a lot of money could push it quickly as, uh, as they did. And that was certainly one of the things that the Trump administration uh, did uh, push, uh, namely dumping a lot of money into vaccine development and testing. And, you know, that's made an enormous difference in this disease uh, you know, apart from the unfortunate politicalization of the vaccine, which is, I think, terrible. You mentioned the horrendous death rate in the United States. I wonder what this has taught you more broadly about the value of P4 medicine, because so many of these deaths can be understood as comorbidities in the way that our society suffers from so many health maladies that are thought to be maladies of modernity, of wealthy countries. Yeah, yeah. So I would say two things. One, it's taught us the imperative necessity to be able to diagnose and understand 
uh, the object of a new pandemic, a new virus, whatever it is. And, and to be, it, it has taught us the importance of diagnosis and to have diagnosis, not just of the disease, but the analysis of the vector itself, because that's critical to following the variants that may have very different phenotypes. So being able to detect and map the nature and strategy the virus uses instantaneously is going to be critical for the future. And uh, I think uh, the second area, of course, is the clear demonstration that comorbidities really increase the risk of this virus. And it's that's an imperative that says to the world, wellness is critical. And frankly, wellness is virtually ignored in the current healthcare system, apart from very trivial kinds of things. So it's the reason, I mean, it's it was the wonderful opening for this beyond the human genome, which is the science of wellness and prevention. That's the essence of what we want to do. And that's exactly what we have to be able to do as rapidly as possible with future pandemics. Well, yeah, last and of course, to deal effectively with this one, which isn't over. And, you know, we still have the question of how long this is going to go on. Lee, I'll ask a question that will be unavoidably cynical sounding to some degree. Given your long-term interest in wellness and your quite right assertion that it's really not part of the conversation in the healthcare industry, to what extent is that not accidental? That healthcare to be profitable needs people to be sick. And what can you do to change the conversation? I think what you can do to change the conversation is to demonstrate unequivocally that wellness is going to strikingly decrease the cost of health care. And the first set of people you have to persuade of that are the payers. And so we're dealing with payers now, making that pitch. And I can very explicitly show lots of different ways we're really going to cut uh, the cost of, of health care. And what I really like is the idea that payers will be integrated together with providers so that if the payers benefit, it automatically benefits the provider as well. Right now, Providence, for example, in Oregon is a payer and a provider. Elsewhere, it's only a provider. And the benefits initially are going to go to the payer. So if we integrate the two together, then so uh, that's uh, so Kaiser, for example, is a beautiful example of an integrated payer provider. And they'd be an ideal subject for the effort that I'm talking about here. And they're an institute I'm going to approach and see if I can't get them on board with this. Lee, of course, wellness has sociological, economic, and political ramifications. Let me ask you one question. I'll ask you, Have in the many times you've gone to physicians, has anyone ever asked you about the health of your brain in any way, shape, or form? Not once. And that is a dramatic oversight that we're going to correct. Okay. We, we're all about brain health as well as body health. And the two are seamlessly integrated. Okay. Okay. All right. So anyway. I want to and, ask. And, and the third one is the gut microbiome health. So we're, we're going to go for all three of those and understanding how they communicate and facilitate and interact with one another. Of course, wellness has sociological, political, economic questions. To what extent is realizing these goals going to require emphasis of these issues at a national level with, for example, just to take one out of many possible examples, the way that cheap, unhealthy food is subsidized where organic whole foods are more expensive. How can we ever expect to be an economically uh, a healthy society if it's so difficult economically to eat healthy? Well, look, I think what is quite clear is 
You know, I like to talk about P4 medicine, predictive, preventive, personalized. Those first three ORs were all science, and we know basically how to do those. The fourth P is participatory. How do we get patients to participate, physicians to participate, healthcare administrators to agree? How do we get the regulatory people, the payers, et cetera? And, and it's that fourth P, which we're actually going to have to learn how to do. Part of it is going to be education, but a big part of it is psychology. And I can, I've thought a lot about this. I can give you a lot of examples about how we might go about it, but it's, it, we're going to have to change the healthcare system in its entirety. We're going to fundamentally have to change how pharma operates. It's totally disease-based today. I mean, the companies like J&J &J that profess a commitment to wellness, the, the funds they spend on wellness are beyond trivial. And it's just a lip service and there's nothing to it. And so uh, how are we going to create these fundamental changes? One will show that we can, I, I think in the end, it's going to be patient driven. I think we'll show to patients, we can transform how they feel. And look, health is the key to the rest of your life. If you aren't healthy, you can't appreciate education or, or jobs or community or all of these other kinds of things. It's, it's fundamental to being a creative, uh, uh, rewarded, excited kind of person. And I think one of the things we're doing are setting up courses in high school that will teach P4 medicine to high school students so they can realize how important wellness is and how important it is for them to participate in their own health. Lee, you mentioned the importance of public awareness in connecting brain health with body health. To clarify, in what ways do you mean mental health? In what ways do you specifically mean the health of the, the brain neurologically or biologically? I mean both. Absolutely both. And the assays that we'll be using are digital uh, assays of the brain that can assess, there, there are about 40 different measurements that can assess various aspects of uh, cognitive abilities and are of the order of 20, 25 cognitive abilities. So with these digital assessments, you can say uh, your reaction time is wrong, your depth of field is too narrow. It's what happens to old people and why they have car wrecks. And you can train them to regain their depth of field. And you can show in clinical trials, people on that kind of brain training have strikingly few, fewer accidents than controls, okay? Just to give it to you. But another thing is, that, and the guy we're, we're collaborating with is Michael Merzenik, who is a very famous uh, neurophysiologist uh, who got the Kevley Prize, uh, it's equivalent of the Nobel Prize in neurobiology for proving that the brain is elastic. And in fact, what he showed is for a normal person, your cognitive abilities rise to a maximum in your mid thirties and for most people decay thereafter. So what he did was take in a beautiful control experiment, 10 80 year olds, and show by these kinds of management, he could bring them up to what they would have extrapolated to have been in their mid thirties. So it means you can regain lost functions at any time, as long as you haven't lost neurons and had real damage in the brain. So, and, and those physiologic things reflect the underlying mechanisms that lead to these cognitive functions. So you can see, um, so we, we are looking at how well the brain is functioning and optimizing it from wherever you are. 
Lee, if I may observe, you obviously practice what you preach in the realm of wellness. You're at an age when many people are retired or obviously worse. And so for yourself, for your own lifestyle, what are the things that you do, both in terms of diet, in terms of exercise, in terms of keeping yourself mentally engaged? Well, I think the most important thing I do is I'm a fanatic exerciser. So for example, I can do, I do 200 push-ups in two sets of a hundred. Okay. Every day in the morning. And I, I spend an hour exercising. And then when I'm in a good place, I, I run, I ran four or five miles for most of the COVID thing. When I lived at a home I have on Friday Harbor and there are wonderful roads that have no people on them and you can run in the grass alongside the roads and everything. But I think exercise is key. And the reason I say that, and I'm utterly, I don't have clinical evidence for it, is exercise, exercise that really elevates your heart rate, oxygenates your blood. And if you oxygenate it well an hour or two a day, and I usually run for an hour and then exercise for an hour. Uh, I think that's really key to keeping a healthy brain. But I'm, I'm, I weigh what I weighed when I played college football, so I've kept my weight down. I, um, I eat carefully. I avoid sugar. I have a terrible uh, history of cardiovascular disease, and um, uh, I'm in great shape so far, whereas my brother has had all sorts of problems. Uh, and and uh, I think sleep is important too. And in the last few years, I've really started, I used to sleep five hours a day. And I think, I think for a lot of reasons, as you get older, that is uh, not a healthy thing to do. Lee, so what, anyway. is, what do you under, how do you understand evolution? in the role of exercise. In other words, we did not evolve to be sedentary creatures. To what extent is that really what this is all about? Well, I think it, it, that's correct. And it's, it's about, it's, I mean, if you have to uh, run and work hard to get enough food to survive, then you're doing all the things I'm talking about. Yeah. But uh, so I think, the sedentary life we have. And, you know, Zooms are absolutely deadly. And I've started trying to limit my Zooms, most cases, to 50 minutes so I can just get up and walk around and get a bit of exercise and everything. So, and I try and get my 10,000 steps. I walk to work, which is a mile and a half or so uh, each way. So that's good, healthy exercise. Lee, as a healthcare executive, what moments of opportunity do you see now in terms of the way that there's a COVID outbreak in a particular place and the hospital systems are entirely overwhelmed with no ICU beds, nurses and doctors totally getting burned out? Obviously, this is a major problem, but it's also an opportunity to rethink the system. What are those opportunities that you see? Well, you know, the problem is a lot of those burnouts are occurring in red states that are fanatically, dogmatically uh, right wing. And, and that's, uh, that's a lot of the anti-vax comes right out of the attitudes that Trump really pushed. So I think those, it, I, I mean, it's amazing how resistant the anti-vaxxers are even when they see their own relatives dying around them to, I mean, it's not rational. So how you deal with that level of irrationality, uh, I don't know. I mean, it is a great opportunity. And, you know, Idaho is dumping cases into Spokane because they don't begin you know, they've run out of caskets. They've, I mean, it's just a nightmare there, place there. But there's, I mean, they're going to have a an election for governor where 
one candidate is is right wing all the way, anti-vax all the way, anti-mask all the way. I mean, it's I I don't know what you do. As an immunologist, did you ever think that you'd live to see the day where anti-vax sentiment might mean that measles, mumps, and rubella might make a comeback? Uh, never. I mean, it just, it was inconceivable. And I guess, uh, you know, a critical question you can ask is, well, you've had a lot of vaccines that allow you to live to become an adult. Uh, and, you know, what they can say is, well, you know, it has little robots that Bill Gates invented that are uh, contaminating the vaccine or the vaccine didn't do a proper clinical trial. And that's nonsense. These these had really intensive clinical trials and probably better results than things like influenza have had, actually. So, I mean, there's, it's, they can make up any story they want about the vaccine and, you know, and you put it on social media and boom, it's all over the place. What are the takeaways of the booster? Is three really going to be sufficient or are we going to be chasing our tails unendingly? No one knows. There are even some good scientists that argue that the booster is insufficient. My own feeling is you ought to take that booster and get recharged with regard to uh, your antibodies. And, and, and the thing that they haven't investigated at all, which is the T-cell cellular immunity, I think that's really important. And we don't have any idea how that decays with time. So those are just fundamental things that haven't been done. But I took the booster, and I think it's a good idea. Lee, let's move on from COVID discussions to really a broad set of questions about your sense of science, your identity as a scientist. So first, perhaps most fundamental, you can call yourself at the end of the day so many different things, a scientist, a physician, an entrepreneur, a visionary, the list goes on and on and on. If you just had to pick one to wear as a name tag, what would it be? Um, I guess... In my heart, uh, a geneticist. A geneticist. I mean, you know, the DNA is the source code of life. It's what uh, allows us to be constructed. It's true that that source code plus your lifestyle plus your environment all uh, work together to, to define the phenome or your health at any point in time. But, you know, fundamentally, uh, it starts with genetics, and and so uh, if I could, but I've been called all of those things. So I'm, uh, uh, I also like visionary because I think I've been ahead of the ball most times, and I am certainly way ahead of it this time. And you know, there are people that will say to me, "Look, I agree with you completely. This is the way it's going to be, but it's twenty years away." And uh, I think that's utter nonsense. If you Those can... are people that don't have perspective into the acceleration of discovery and the transformation of society. Lee, if you could take yourself all the way back to your interactions with Linus Pauling and then fast forward to today in the field of genetics, what are some of the fundamental questions that have really been resolved and which ones remain out there waiting for discovery and understanding? Well, I, th I think uh, it is clear that some diseases are genetic and are primarily caused by single genes. And we, we, we understand, uh, and, and, and there are two kinds of genes that operate, those that can give you the disease with just one bad copy called the dominant gene, and those that seemingly require two bad copies, and those are called recessive genes. And there are probably 7,000 Mendelian recessive diseases that have been defined. But one of the striking things that we found in Aravale 
was we had of the order of 60 or 70 people with a bad gene for a disease called hemochromatosis, okay? And the argument was you needed two bad copies in order to manifest the disease. And when we looked at the broad population, we found uh, nine individuals that had two bad copies, okay? And these were adults, only three had the disease. And, and a reason for that is there could be modifying genes that blocked the disease effect, okay? But we had 45 that had one bad copy of the gene and nine of them had all of the classic signs of hemochromatosis. So all I'm saying is if we have 7,000 Mendelian recessives, we ought to know which ones you have and follow the possible consequences, even if you had just one bad copy, to make sure we catch that disease early on. Because with these people that have one bad copy, most physicians would say, well, you must have something else wrong, but it really could be hemochromatosis. And again, a modifying gene that accelerates the activity of just the one bad copy. So genetics is very complicated and information is the key to ensuring that we can detect as early as possible and treat and reverse uh, diseases like that. Lee, in the course of your career, you've done such important work, both on the fundamental side and the applied side. So my first question there is in terms of your motivation, in terms of you getting excited to put your intellectual energy toward a particular project, where for you is it about just understanding the nature, how how things work at the molecular level? And when are you motivated specifically by applying that knowledge to a particular device, to a particular drug, to a particular policy? How do you weigh those things in determining when and how to work on these issues? Well, early in my career, what I really loved was figuring out how the immune system works. And we did uh, seminal work in that and made a whole series of discoveries. Each was more exciting than the next. And it was, it was absolutely marvelous. And we did some fundamental work in neurobiology and understanding uh, defective genes and what they did. So, it, it, I was uh, really excited about all those things, but as the opportunities grew across time, that is, you know, we invented all of these instruments that let us make lots of measurements on individuals. And then we got involved in the human genome project and that gave us the source code. And for the first time, the ability to look at human genetic variability and compare it against wellness and disease phenotypes and find out, is it one gene or is it many genes and so forth. Uh, and, but, and, and uh, you know, we started the first cross-disciplinary biology department at the University of Washington with the help of Bill Gates. And it was spectacularly successful in developing tools and doing a lot of uh, fundamental tech technology and so forth. But I really wanted to build up on top of that systems biology and felt it was hard to do at a big bureaucratic university. And that's why I resigned and started the Institute for Systems Biology. And it's more than fulfilled the dreams I had for it, uh, at least uh, initially. But as I started applying systems, thinking not only to biology, but to disease, it became clear to me that, you know, if you thought in terms, I mean, we formulated P4 medicine in the early 2000s when no one was thinking about individual medicine or anything like that. And, and what became clear to me is that, that, that healthcare had these two domains, a wellness domain, then completely ignored and a disease domain. And I decided I'd really go after the wellness domain. And we spent 
10 years developing tools, thinking about it, and then in 2014 started a series of experiments and got into it. And th the more we came to understand the benefits of precision population health, the more it became clear that this should be extended to the entire population to optimize wellness and avoid disease, not just deal with disease. And that's where I am now. And my big, my exciting pleasure now is trying to figure out the multitude of challenges that exist in bringing this precision population health to the entire US population. And we'll do it first through a million people and then expanded after that. But how do we even persuade the million patients or their physicians? Because what's fundamentally different about what we're doing from all the other big programs out there, all of us and the British Biobank and so forth, is we are returning actionable possibilities to patients to make them weller and let them avoid the disease. And we really know how to do this now very effectively. So but it's going to take an enormous educational process to, to persuade patients and their physicians to do this. And, and eventually the hospital administrators to accept this kind of thing, uh, or the, the healthcare administrators, I should say. And that's why getting big systems like Kaiser that really pay lip service to wellness. They don't do it very well, but th they appreciate it. And if we could get them engaged, that would be terrific. And I'd love to go to a new medical school like they're starting in Pasadena and help them set up the courses that are gonna bring 21st century medicine to their students. And they don't know how to do that very well themselves right now. Lee, I'd like to ask you about the role that theory plays in your research career. So in biology, in immunology, in your study of disease, in what ways does theory provide the intellectual framework first to raise the most important questions, test them, and see what the most efficacious solutions are on the other side? It's, it's fundamental. It's, uh, I mean... Everything starts with an idea of how X works. And if it works that way, it should do these things and we'll test that. So I think just going out and making measurements, and frankly, there are a lot of people that do that, isn't very fruitful because the, 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 there is an enormous amount of noise in any human measurements you make. And you have to have clear ideas that will let you navigate around that noise and formulate hypotheses that can be tested for their reality. So signal to noise is a big problem. And, and frankly, that's something that I think a lot of computational biologists don't completely understand. And you know, it, and domain expertise is really important because it reduces the dimensionality of the search space for mechanisms that you need to uh, to interrogate. And uh, <clears throat> for example, IBM failed with Watson in their cancer program because they were really convinced that smart engineers could tell doctors what they needed. And they didn't begin to understand the complexity of actual medicine or what physicians really needed. And I remember going out to Schenectady, New York, their headquarters, and giving them a lecture, I don't know, six or 12 months before this, this all crashed. And I made, my whole point was, you need to bring in domain expertise. You have a very powerful tool but the tool itself is insufficient. You need, you need to give it priors with people who really know cancer biology and clinical cancer biology. Otherwise, you're gonna get lost in 
data and noise and signal and 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 they did they really failed so so having clearly formulated hypotheses at a simple level of how a few genes work or at a level of how a system works is really important lee is there in your mind some future understanding to be achieved of what we might call a grand unified theory of genetics that might unlock disease prevention and therapy for which now of course is not not anything but a pipe dream you know i think what we will be able to do is develop the tools to navigate disease and get to its source far more effectively than we can now i mean with three billion nucleotides in the genome uh, and the ability to mutate them and to modify gene behavior in all sorts of different ways. I, I don't think, see physics is infinitely simpler because you have a finite number of elements that are manipulated. Biology, the elements work in combinations and if you have billions of elements that can work in combinations, that's a number so staggering you can't even think about it if, if you're to do the combinatorics. I mean, one of the challenges we face with the data, just the data that we'll be generating in the Million Person Project is you want to do the combinatorics to ask, is this little data element statistically linked to this data element down there? But if you have 10 to the 54th possibilities of doing those linkages, there isn't enough time to do those analyses. And, and, and frankly, we're collaborating with one of two groups that is going to have really good quantum computing, hopefully in the next five to 10 years. And that'll move us further ahead. But it, even that probably is going to be too small to let us do the combinatorics of all of the elements, data elements that are in uh, a living human being. So I, I think there won't be a grand field theory, but there'll be very clever ways we can set the constraints of what we search. So A, we get rid of noise, and, and B, we can look at a reasonable level at what is likely to be causative. Okay, so this this whole idea of so I think theory and understanding the system and setting priors and constraints because I mean you, you know the great thing about all the human data we have it's going to transform how we do computing because our current computing is so slow and so inadequate and maybe quantum computing is going to be the next step up. But there'll be things after that, too, for sure. It's it's mind blowing to think as you convey the complexity of biology that you can already prognosticate that quantum computing isn't going to give us what we need to wrap our minds around these things. Well, no, it'll it'll move us in the right direction. But I think we'll still need to do priors and set constraints because, uh, it, it, you know, Put together a million elements and all of their combinations, and you can see that's a hell of a number. Lee, being in Seattle with Amazon and Microsoft and so many other leading companies in this area in your backyard, do you see opportunities for collaboration at the dawn of quantum computing? Absolutely, yeah. So, well, I'll tell you the one we're talking most actively with is Google, and I'm very excited about what DeepMind can do. So. There are only two places that do hyperscale AI, okay? DeepMind at Google and OpenAI at Microsoft. And, and basically what both of these organizations have done is exponentially increase the instrumentation that allow them to do cycles. So they're orders and orders of magnitude ahead of everyone else in the world. And for me, what's exciting is OpenAI, for example, has already 
digested half of PubMed. So it means I can put all the data from an individual patient into that, and I can ask them to do all the correlations with that the literature in the world. I mean, really, is something humans couldn't even think about. And we're going to come up with all sorts of things that people have never thought about before. And, and contrast that, you know, the, the MIT Technology Magazine came out with an article recently that said, look, there are 500 some AI algorithms that have been developed around COVID. And what's interesting is not a one of them is relevant to clinical uh, practice. So they're, they're all low scale, not sufficient dimensionality searched and all, or they didn't search the right dimensionality. And so having machines that uh, let you do an enormous search first, and then they'll give you data that's reduced in dimensionality that we can apply domain expertise to and really focus on what counts. So anyway, that's my view of one big thing we want to do with beyond the human genome. Lee, the idea of going beyond the human genome, to what extent does that suggest that we've achieved a certain finality in phase one of the genomic project? What more is there to do in the original work and how do we build on that going beyond? Well, um, I would say we aren't there yet because what will take us there most effectively is the ability to have very accurate sequencing with very long reads. And what that will allow us to do is then assemble all of the reads we get de novo and not compare them against inadequate prototype sequences. And number two, it'll let us get through regions of the genome that are dark matter. Now, there was recently published one genome where they claim to have waded through most of the dark matter and maybe they have and maybe they haven't, but that project probably cost uh, several billion dollars and we're not going to be able to do that for individuals. So I want sequencing tools that will give us the ability to get capture the entire genome and put it together and, uh, and then be able to use those data in all of these combinatorics. So I, I think we still have uh, a step to go to solving the dark, dark matter of the human genome. And you, and you it's, use the term it's dark. repetitive sequences, and some people have argued, well, that is interesting because it isn't genes or anything. And it turns out that isn't true at all. There are genes scattered in those repetitive sequences. So we're not done yet. And is your use of the term dark matter, matter like astrophysicists, they know it's there, but they don't know what it is? The same yeah. idea? Same idea. Lee, to what extent is going beyond the human genome the first step in truly personalized medicine? Well, we've taken baby steps in personalized medicine with Aravail and things like that. But this is a necessary step to have any hope to think about extending it to the entire U.S. or eventually the world, okay? And so that's why showing the power of these million sequences and the enormous, I mean, we're gonna generate thousands of new actionable possibilities, probably tens of thousands, and they're all gonna have to be delivered to physicians by AI because it'll be so complex, they'll never understand it. So for example, we're developing as a prototype an approach to Alzheimer's, which essentially takes this complexity and it will deliver diagnosis and therapy to physicians in Walla Walla, Washington that have no expertise in Alzheimer's, but we'll be giving them the same diagnostics a super expert in Alzheimer's would get in a big medical center. 
And that's what we're going to do for all physicians in the future. We'll let them become experts by virtue of AI, and it'll explain the rationale. It'll give them references if they want to look things up, but it'll tell them what they have to do for this patient. Lee, I wonder if you can reflect on the value broadly conceived in getting an MD, of being a medical doctor, in terms of the questions you ask, in terms of your approach to therapies and interacting with patients, and specifically the value in the sequencing of your education where you did the undergraduate, you got the MD, and then you went back for the PhD. How do you see these things working? Oh, I think they work perfectly. Because when I, Caltech gave me a terrific background in math and chem and physics and all of those things. And it gave me a very deep understanding of simple biology, microbes and bacteria and things like that. It, it had but one course that got into more uh, like complex biology, human biology anyway, and that's why I went to medical school, was to learn human biology and human pathology. And I learned it, and it framed all the things I ended up doing later on the clinical side of things. And it gave me the ability to tie together this world of science with the world of medicine, I think, in unique ways that let me translate complexity in very powerful ways with regard to uh, medicine and so forth. And so going to Caltech, getting the basic background, going to medical school and learning human biology and pathology, and then coming back to Caltech and, uh, and, and doing molecular immunology, biochemistry, it was absolutely, it worked out for me beautifully well. And I, you know, I was successful enough in my PhD that after that, I actually went to NIH and had a staff position and just skipped the postdoc and got to learn how to do science there for three years before I ended up then coming back to Caltech. Lee, of course, you don't operate in the ivory tower and the problems that you deal with are very much problems in the real world. What have you learned as an entrepreneur in building devices, in selling them, in creating companies? To what extent have you gained value in the business world and applying what you've learned there to wellness and medicine? Well, um, so my fundamental belief, and this is something I learned from my mentor at Caltech, Bill Dreyer, is one, you always want to practice biology at the leading edge. And you want to be in the excitement of discovery and, uh, and, and a field that's driving forward in an exciting fashion. But two, he made the argument, if you really want to change a field, you invent new technology that gives you a new window into biology that lets you do things that never before could have been done. So those were the driving forces for me in initially, uh, you know, developing over the years, the six instruments that we did, all of them turned out to be enormously successful in three different uh, companies, Applied Biosystems, um, Agilent, and then uh, Nanostring, uh, so my other, I remember, I remember having a really interesting talk with Murph Goldberger, I would guess in about 79 or so, when I came to him and I said, Murph, I've uh, got this uh, great idea for a company. We're now developing four instruments and I think they're really going to change biology. And I'd like to get these instruments uh, out into the world. And I said, uh, you know, uh, can I, uh, Caltech help me in some way commercialize these things? Because I, at that time, hadn't thought much about commercialization. And Murph Goldberger, 
gave me a long lecture on the role of academic institutions is education and scholarship, not commercialization. And I said to him, look, Murph, my feeling is anything I discover that's important for society, I owe it to society to bring it there and make it available to everyone. And he just basically said, well, if that's how you feel, that's fine, but you're on your own. You go figure out how to do this. Caltech isn't going to help you. And so that's how I got started in uh, thinking about companies. So I, I, you may have read this, but anyway, I went to over the next year plus 19 different instrument companies and all of them but one, DuPont, turned me down. And in the end, DuPont decided to do a clinical chemistry machine rather than the machines I proposed. I went to three, three different times to Beckman because Arnold was on the board and everything. And the third time I went, this was in Palo Alto, they said, we know it's your shopping lead, don't come back, we're not interested. So, and the irony was about two or three weeks later, I gave a lecture on these four instruments to the Caltech trustees and Arnold came running up after this lecture and he said, this is incredible. It's just what Beck, Beckman Instruments needs. And I said, gee, I don't think so. I went to them three different times and they, he said, that's impossible. Maybe they misunderstood you. And, uh, and it was really interesting. I found out later that he flew up the next day to uh, uh, San Francisco and talked with these guys. And they said, oh, Lee misled us. He clearly wanted to set up his own company rather than have it done by us, which was utterly a lie in every way. I tried, I thought Beckman would be the natural one. So, uh, and that led to, as you might diff imagine, difficulties with Beckman, which got, which got eventually patched up and everything. Lee, I'll just My, I'll just note editorially that Murph Goldberger's ideas about academia being exclusively the domain of scholarship and education—that's decidedly not where Caltech is now. Of course, it's moved very much in the direction of obviously scholarship and, and education are fundamental, but entrepreneurship is very much a part of Caltech's culture now. Absolutely, no, and I claim some credit for pushing them that way. I mean, the automated sequencer really brought a lot of money into Caltech. They did very well off that instrument. Lee, of all your work in wellness and in disease prevention and, and, and therapies, is there any particular disease or class of disease that you're most passionate about, either because it interests you the most or from a public health perspective, you feel the most urgency that this is where your attentions are most needed? Alzheimer's. My wife was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in um, 2005, and she's still alive after a fashion today. And it's been just an unmitigated tragedy. And I think we're at a position where that isn't going to be a future. I think we can really turn this disease around. So. I've spent an enormous effort and time in, in Alzheimer's. Lee, you work in a multidisciplinary environment, both in terms of your own areas of expertise and the people that you collaborate with. And so I'd like to ask, where do you see ongoing value in segmentation, in area expertise, in people being narrowly focused? And where do you see value in not just thinking outside the box, but working in an interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary environment where everybody is talking to everybody and these administrative walls simply don't exist? Well, I'll tell you, I, I favor the latter, obviously, because that's been my life. But I will say what is critical for young people is that they really have the tools they need to understand biology. And I would say there are several kinds of tools. So one is you have to understand biology deeply and probably you want to study one subject and really 
get into the nitty gritty so you can apply that to all the other things you might think about in your future. Number two is any biologist today has to have really good computational skills. I mean, for searching, for dealing with enormous amounts of data and analyzing it and so forth, for, for thinking about, you know, how to create models that can be tested computationally. So I think, I think uh, bioengineering is, if I were doing it over again, I'd be a bioengineer in a microsecond. Um, and I think the third thing that's really key is that you have to have a really good understanding of the frontier tools for doing biology. Not to, the, you know, the theoretical aspects, but you, you have to understand how imaging works, how measurements work, how, you know, all of those kind of things. So, and if you have those things, then you can be terribly broad and cross-disciplinary and really get a lot done. But I think there is, even in the cross-disciplinary environment, you know, there are, there are some people who are really exceptional at computational aspects of it. And, you know, even with a lot of training, you're, you're not going to be able to touch those people. So, you know, you have to decide how far you go, how far your skills take you. But, but I think, I mean, ISB has been an enormously cross-disciplinary environment. The, the uh, Department of Molecular Biotechnology at the medical school in Washington was terrific cross-disciplinary. My lab at Caltech was cross-disciplinary and, you know, that led to real sources of friction with other faculty members because I got told by a number of people, your lab is way too big. It's not in the spirit of Caltech. And, and a large part of the reason it was big, I needed a lot of different skills. And, uh, and I ran a facility that helped other people micro sequence and synthesize DNA. And, 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 you know, that's what pushed me to think about a cross disciplinary department where the faculty members brought the major skills and then, you know, and they were all accessible. So you could, you didn't have them within a lab. Lee, I'm acutely aware of not overly contributing to this crisis of Zoom sedentary lifestyles. And so for the last part of our talk today, I'd like to ask a few nomenclature questions. Questions okay. about your understanding of terms and putting them in historical context. So let's start first with perhaps the most basic, systems biology. Tell me about the development of this term and what you recognized about new approaches to old ways of understanding and doing things. Well, I would say I started thinking about, and I didn't call it initially systems biology in the uh, uh, early 1990s, and um, well, actually, I would say in the late 80s, I started thinking about some systems approaches. And I actually put a couple of grants into NSF, which never went anywhere. They never, ever figured out what I was talking about. And maybe I wasn't very clear. But, uh, but throughout the 90s, I came to realize that biology was was really the, the unit of operation of biology in a sense were systems that were interconnected to one another and did discrete things and the systems had multiple elements that could do different kinds of things and that got to the whole idea of systems biology needing to be global and holistic in nature, trying to understand all the elements that went toward immunity or uh, the adaptive immune response or whatever it is you wanted to think about. And, and the need for having the means for measuring those elements 
and how they changed with time because systems were dynamical. And, and, and to look at a system at a given point in time wasn't that informative. You had to see how it changed as it executed its function to begin to really understand it. So, you know, so the idea of systems was quickly um, making lots and lots of measurements so you could look at lots of data. It was starting to think about the emerging, evolving understanding of systems. And initially, these were defined by protein-protein interactions and the things that and we find them in yeast, and then we move them to higher animals. And, and th those were kind of the language of systems biology. And, and, and we created hierarchies and, 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 and different dimensions. And it was clear you had to think about systems biology at the molecular level, at the cellular level, at the level of organs and how they operated, and finally, at the level of the whole individual. And each of those successively higher levels of organization integrated together many different elements that you had to be able to understand and define. So uh, if you want to look at a human being, how do we look at the organs? How can we? And, and, and that raised really interesting ideas that. Uh, have only partially been exploited about you can look in the blood because it bathes all organs and they secrete into the blood or shed into the blood proteins and uh, there are proteins that are uniquely specific for organs so if we look at them in the blood we can see how they change with time and that infers what's happening in that organ and you know it's it's those are the kind of systems thinking that that we applied to it. So it's it, systems thinking is global. It's holistic. It's uh, integrative. It's um, it's um, functional in the sense of defining small systems that aggregate into larger and larger systems. And you you have to try and isolate systems and understand them in the smaller context before you can integrate them together uh, in the larger context. So that's, uh, those are the kind of ideas that came up. And then when I went to the University of Washington in 92, from the very first, I would always thought I'd be able to build this cross-disciplinary framework and then on top of that, we could put systems biology in. And um, well, I can give you examples of why that failed. One, I'll give you two examples, and there were probably 20. But one was I, I uh, went to the dean and said, uh, look, I really need a lot of computing power for what I want to do. And, there's nothing set up in the building. I'm in for uh, molecular biotechnology. And so he hooked me up with the head of computing for the university who came down and visited me and he looked around the department we had and he opened up this small room, janitor's room, and he said, look, this is all the room you need. Biologists don't need much in the way of computation. And, you know, it's it just... And I said it wasn't true. And he said, well, you know, uh, he, he, he wasn't going to make anything complicated for something he thought wasn't going to be used. And or the other thing was that really got me is uh, at that time, I knew Bill Gates better than anyone in the medical school and probably in the university, basically. Yet the dean and president came to me and said, I could never go to Bill Gates and ask for anything without their permission. And I said, that's ridiculous. I know what he likes, what he's interested in. Why can't I have conversations? And they said, nope, that's the rule. And I decided, you know, if I was going to build systems, biology would cost money. And yet 
at the university, I had to go through their uh, it, a system that was really pretty mediocre for asking for money. And uh, I, th I thought this isn't going to work. But, you know, it's those kind of things. Lee, it's so. been written that your career not only has coincided with the so-called biotechnology revolution, but that your research has fostered and even enabled the biotechnology revolution. So my first question is, do you have a specific memory of when the term biotechnology came into use? And then what were some of the key advances, both on the bio side and the technology side, that allowed for this revolution to flower? Right. Well, biotechnology was certainly being used actively in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. So, um, and, and it, uh, we, we saw Amgen when we started as a biotechnology company, a genetic engineering focus, but a biotechnology company. Um, so, uh, but what was very clear is as your idea about companies differentiated, they started to separate out one from another and become unique and distinguishable. And in some cases, it was the subject matter they approached. In other cases, it was the technologies they used. But I would say the first four instruments that we developed, uh, the protein and DNA sequencer and protein and DNA synthesizers, really were the foundation of biotechnology in the uh, 80s and, and uh, 90s and so forth. And they all led to uh, evolutionary changes. For example, the fifth instrument that we developed was to use inkjet printer technology to synthesize DNA in uh, as arrays or as free fragments of DNA uh, at hundreds of thousands of different fragments very rapidly. And, and so that was a step up in DNA synthesis. And Agilin still uses that basic technology that we invented uh, today. And, and, you know, the final technology we invented was the one that Nanostring uses to barcode the identity initially of uh, nucleic acids, both RNA and and DNA, so you could look at single molecule analysis and moving to single molecules was obviously an important step. So I would say the instruments that we developed really laid the broad framework for, and they're in, in various forms, they're all being used today still. Lee, so. do you see genetics and genomics operating more in parallel as they historically developed in the modern era? Or is genomics more of an outgrowth of genetics? Uh, I think there are two very distinct entities. And I remember when we were pushing in the genome project in the uh, late 80s, NIH's argument about why we didn't need to do the genome project, and they opposed it up to the very end. It was basically, they were spending $300 million a year on genetics and that was the same as genomics. And it, that couldn't have been more wrong and more false. So, no, I see them as entirely separate. And genetics is a very powerful tool for understanding what the elements of the genome do. So the genome is, it's the entire source code. And, and really, it's how it operates in three dimensions, and there's been a lot of recent exciting discoveries about that as well, uh, and epigenetics and all of those kind of things. But um, so the, the technologies were key to the driving of biotechnology, and, and those included the ability to manipulate DNA and, and uh, modify genes and gene editing, all of those kind of things uh, were important aspects. The ability to put genes into both cells and into animals, those were all really, and so all of those things. Uh, 
collectively were would come under the rubric of uh, biotechnology. It's just the technology of biology, the technology that enables you to investigate biology. And in a more modern context, how do you understand the development of proteomics? Um, well, proteomics uh, really got started with the automated Edmund instrument that we uh, perfected and optimized to be 200 times more sensitive. And that's what let us sequence very small amounts of protein and then synthesize DNA probes, clone the corresponding genes and learn what they were all about. And we, we put together this integrated microchemical facility and we did that for about 25 or 30 different genes and they broke up in new fields. We sequenced, for example, the prion protein with Stan Prussner in 95, he got the Nobel Prize for breaking open the prion, prion hypothesis of uh, brain disease and things like that. We, we were able to microsequence the acetylcholine receptor chains of the torpedo with Mike Raftery, who was a chemistry professor. And I said, Mike, this is incredible. We can now clone the genes and it can open up all of neurochemistry. And Mike said, nope, the most important thing to do is physical chemistry of this molecule. And so he forbid us to go on and do gene cloning. And about six months later, a uh, Japanese person used our sequences to clone human neural receptors and he broke the field wide open. It was, uh, it, and that's fine. We did other interesting things. So the technology was important, but uh, increasingly the uh, computational tools became important as the complexity grew and you had to make the, the analytic uh, comparisons and combinatorics of uh, are things uh, linked to one another in biology and all the things we talked about earlier. So I would say biotechnology was a deep understanding of how to manipulate genes, uh, the technologies for manipulating all the informational molecules uh, and the uh, computational tools we needed to begin modeling and dealing with the increasing complexity of biology as, as it came to be understood. Lee, two final questions today that will have even somewhat of a spiritual or philosophical bent to them. You've thought a lot and you've written extensively about the notion of paradigm shifts in the field. And so I wonder if you can talk about your belief that there is some larger truth that scientific advances is moving toward, or rather more in a Cunian sense, that there might not be that larger truth, and that the shifts that we're achieving are relevant in its own time, but might not necessarily get us to that larger truth? Boy, that's a tough question, I will say. I think in biology, there is enormous complexity and the reason domain expertise is so important is you have to pull that complexity apart and analyze it piece by piece, system by system kind of thing. That is taking on the complexity in its entirety is, <coughs> is, is, is really, really complex. I do believe in the idea of emergent properties that as systems get more complex, they give rise to relationships that, that wouldn't have been initially derivable. And I believe as we learn more and more about biology, th that we will get more and more holistic pictures of how things operate. So, and, and I think we'll be able to take individual systems and come to understand 
in enormous detail how they operate. And I include the brain in that. I think there's been spectacular work on the wiring of the brain and analyzing the dynamics of the brain in the context of all of that complexity. What, what I am really intrigued about is consciousness. And I don't necessarily see uh, how, I, I think consciousness is gonna be the last human frontier. And uh, I think it will require concepts that we don't have today. And maybe they'll emerge from the, the, uh, these, these emerging properties and so forth. And maybe we'll come to see how we can understand them, but it's, I think, and, and you know, how the human brain works, we're, we're still a long ways from understanding that, but boy, have we developed the tools that are going to give us uh, lots and lots of fundamental insights. And my whole attitude toward biology is, look, it's really complex. What is key is that you solve problems as you can solve them. And in doing so, you open up new frontiers where you can go to solve the next problems. And the, the big long-term problems, uh, we won't be around for. But I'll tell you, if I succeed with this beyond the Human Genome Project, it'll be a quantum step pushing us forward in understanding the health of the microbiome, the body, and the brain. Frontiers and consciousness is the perfect segue to my last question, and that is, given how well-developed your ideas are about the complexity of the human body and how well understood you are in appreciating how much there is that we don't yet know, is that all to assume that with enough time, with enough advances in technology and ingenuity and understanding, all aspects of the human body, including the mind, are knowable? Or is it possible, would you accept the possibility that there are some things that are unknowable because they have dimensions that are not physical or even spiritual? So uh, I would agree with what you said, except for the mind and things like consciousness, I, I don't know whether we can get there. Um, you know, I have a very good friend who's dying of AML. He probably has six months left to live. And he's a computational biologist at ISB, a remarkable scientist and a remarkable human being. And he's come to a very holistic belief that there is something beyond, and that's given him an enormous peace in having him leave his family and his friends with the most positive thoughts of him and, and how he's taking all of this. So uh, so I, um, and he said he's moved from being an atheist to, uh, he, he said that there is something in the spiritual that is real for him. And that's all I can say. I haven't, I mean, maybe when I get to that stage of my life, which I think is a long ways away, I'm, you know, my biological age is actually about 15 years younger than my chronologic age. And so I figure I have another good 25 years before I have to pack it in. So I'm not going to worry about those things. But who knows? I'm, and I think people can make their own realities in these regards. And I think they have the right to. So that's what I'd say. Well, Lee, for next time, we'll take it all the way back to the beginning of your chronological and biological age. We'll go back to Missoula, and I'll learn about your family background and childhood. <laughs>